Welcome to the Active Travel Adventures podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks. On our last episode, David and Tina talked to us about their Galapagos adventures, and today we continue with them as they tell us about their mainland Ecuador adventures. So let's get started. On our last episode, we had Dave and Tina tell us about their Galapagos adventure, but while they were down in Ecuador, they also went on an Ecuadorian adventure as well. So they've graciously come back on the program to tell us about what they did down there. So welcome back to the program. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kit. So I'm assuming you tied this in with, while you're going down to the Galapagos. Tell us, A, why did you decide to add on Ecuador? And just give us a broad overview of your trip, if you would. Well, once you've made the decision to come down to South America, the Galapagos trip was probably about 10 days. And we'd like to take advantage of uh, maybe something, tacking something else onto a trip. We've been down to Machu Picchu previously, been to Patagonia. And so Ecuador is right there. So we decided that we would do a separate trip to Ecuador. And of course, you can either do that before or after you visit uh, Galapagos, whatever works for you. And the way the active adventure tours work, they're actually linked up so that you might have a day or two in between, but you can make it a, a continuous experience of Ecuador. So when we think of Ecuador, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is the equator. It's the middle of the earth, so to speak. And the capital city is Quito, and all the international flights usually fly into Quito, and then you can get out to the Galapagos with a flight through Guayaquil, which is the big coastal city, the largest city in Ecuador. But the trip that we went on was about five or six days, and it uh, started in Quito, and then did a big circle around, and we ended back in Quito at the end. So when you think of Ecuador, the first thing that comes to mind is volcanoes. There's a number of active volcanoes still, and there's some great climbing tours if you like those. But you have a chance to see the highlands. You get down into the cloud forests, the rainforest, the Amazon, and you can get all the way down to the beach, but we didn't go that far but experienced a number of different altitudes. Quito is about 9,000 feet above sea level. And so right there, you might start to experience some altitude challenges. Everyone's a little bit different. So it's good to know how well you do in altitudes before you do a lot of traveling around Ecuador. I think we went out to the highlands. I was about 12,000 feet above sea level. Then we dropped down, I think, as low as about 2,000. So that's about 10,000 feet in elevation change over the course of a couple of days. Yeah. As somebody who is altitude challenged, I start feeling it around 8,000 feet. And then around 12, five ish, I start getting the mild headaches and all that. So for somebody like me, would you recommend going a day or two early to acclimate before you actually started an adventure? Yes. yes, for sure. I think one of the challenges with this tour is you didn't really spend a lot of time at the same altitude to really get acclimatized. Certainly keto, you need to at least spend a day there before it starts, a day or two, and to get acclimatized. I do suffer some mild symptoms, challenges getting a full breath at night might get a bit of a headache. But if you're only there for a day, you may or may not want to take medications at a higher level before you move lower. Well, what we did, we did a bike, uh, quite a long bike ride on our first day, remember? Of the tour, yes. Yeah, in keto. And what originally it was supposed to be at a higher altitude, but they decided the guide felt that they had changed the itinerary because they said it just wasn't a safe road anymore. They always have to adapt to changes. So we just rode our bikes along a beautiful, we were up high. It was a valley all around Quito and it was just stunning. And I didn't find the altitude bothered me at all. But we spoke to several people, including friends who had been there before. And they said, oh, really, you got to watch it. Quito, the altitude, it'll really affect you. But we were okay because we went there We did the five-day trip after being in Galapagos, and we had been in Quito for about three days before, too. 
but I'm fortunate it doesn't bother me. That's good. And you can never really predict whether or not you are affected by altitude. So it's best to drink lots of water and be prepared and maybe check with your doctor ahead of time. They do have some altitude pills that you can take or bring if you do have issues, because we're not getting to dangerous altitude. We're just getting where the body might have a little bit of problem acclimating. Yeah, we took them in when we were in Peru, mainly in the Cusco area because it's so high. Yeah, it's a great trip. And then it's usually something you can get over. And as again, you're not climbing mountains here. You're just out for a hike. And uh, normally once you acclimatize fairly, once you're active, you acclimatize fairly quickly. And the other point I wanted to make was we were very, very fortunate in our mainland Ecuador tour. Usually they have a minimum of, I think, four or five people. And a couple people canceled and we were the only ones on the tour. So that made it pretty special. In fact, our guide just drove us around in his own car and he was extremely attentive. He actually was more of a manager in the office. He would do tours too. But anyways, it was pretty special because we felt it was just all about us. So very accommodating. Well, it sounds like your own private little tour. Very cool. And so on it the was. bike, it sounds like the bike that you went on, unless this is what got redirected, was almost like what we call a rails to trails here, an old railroad bed that is converted to a bicycle path. You know what? Part of it was an old railway trail. It was quite scenic. So you had a few ups and downs. And but along the way, you actually go through parks interlinked with the trail. So it was a nice way to get around and see some greenery as well. And you're into the valleys. Quite lovely. And so what exactly does the landscape look like there? It's very, I guess, mountainous is the way I describe it, with lots of valleys and peaks. So you're either going up or down or traversing. And quite green and deep, deep valleys with cliffs on either side, narrow waterways. Nice. And from what I understand, if the weather is clear, sometimes you might be able to see the snow cat peep of Cotopaxi. Is that possible? Yeah. Or can you tell us about that? Yes, we saw Cotopaxi several times, especially driving to the airport. It would be pointed out. And we did do a horseback riding trip up high and Cotopaxi was in full view. So we felt very lucky. We had good weather. We did have a bit of rain in Mindo. Sometimes it can be cloudy, so you may not be able to see it. But as soon as the the skies opened up, Cotopaxi is quite visible at a little over 19,000 feet, snow covered. Everywhere. Most people in Ecuador, they love the volcanoes. They talk about them all the time. They're almost sacred. And that is their highest one, correct? Yes, I think so. There's about two or three which run between 18,000 and 20,000 feet. There's actually, I think I mentioned early tours you can go on if you really want to do. We saw t-shirts where people who have climbed the seven volcanoes. Wow. And this was a multi-sport adventure as well, because you said you also went horseback riding. Yeah. Yes, that's quite unique. And I'm not an expert uh, horseback rider enough to get on, but it was just like a nice gentle ride. Our guide, much more experienced. He asked us if he could go on ahead. And sure, we said, yeah. So he got up to a nice canter and a gallop. We just enjoyed the ride and took us right up into this big ranch, a hacienda, big piece of property. And we just stayed on this property. And there was a dog that came with us from the farm. that They had just adopted. Yeah. So just a nice general ride with beautiful vistas and nice greenery. And the interesting thing about this riding, they call it you're a chagra. I guess that's the name for an Ecuadorian horse person. And you wear uh, woolly chaps from sheepskin and you wear a poncho. So we looked the part for sure. Yes, I saw the photo of you in the poncho. So it's going to be on the website if you want to see the attire there. Like I've probably only been on a horse maybe half a dozen times in my life. Are they used to people that are not necessarily? Oh, yes. Personal? We've done trail rides. In the Rockies, we did a week-long trip, and Dave and I did some lessons. Our kids always rode horses, so they just follow the trail. They're very comfortable. And, and I do. Horses always go when it's time to go home and where the barn is. Yeah, exactly. 
And I have to mention again, David talked about their dog came with us. I believe the dog had recently been adopted. In fact, in Ecuador, the dogs adopt you. That's something that really stood out to me is that there are stray dogs everywhere in Ecuador. And most people, you ask them, like our guide, I said, how many dogs do you have? He says, oh, we've got three. Because <laughs> you know? everyone just, you just see them and you bring them home. But I have to say they were, I think just because in North America, you have to have your dog on a leash. It's just, everyone's so paranoid about it. But down there, and I also noticed that in Peru, the dogs are just so polite and sweet. I think they know their place. And that's what actually we were told too. They know that, you know, don't hang around too much. And they're just wandering around and just being together and being very sweet and needing a home. <laughs> I saw in Bhutan too, just there's almost as many dogs as people it sometimes seem like. They're just everywhere. Mm-hmm. Was in Bhutan, you said? In Bhutan, yes. But I didn't see them as pets so much as just part of the outdoor culture. They're just dogs everywhere. I've never seen so many animals. They're in charge of the road here and everybody just kind of goes around them. And the only time they got excited was when a van went by and they got up and all started barking. And our guide said, and again, a good point of having a guide because they know what's going on. They said, oh, that's the same kind of van that the dog pound comes to when they come through to give them rabies shots. So the dogs remembered that that was the van that makes them feel pain. <laughs> so Aww. They knew to get excited when they saw that van. <laughs> yeah. No, I just was amazed. But this dog, they had just ended up living at the Hacienda and he came with us on the whole trail. Such a good dog and just always made sure everyone was okay. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's it cool. was a long walk too. So he had a good nap. Now, do you stay in the Hacienda at night or are you there for the horseback ride or what's going on there? We stayed for the night. It was, I think, built sometime in the 1800s. It was quite old, David, wasn't it? Yes, beautifully maintained natural wood ceilings, thatch roof, and then again, traditional meals as well. So a very, very nice setting. Yeah, it was cozy. You felt like you were in someone's home. In fact, it was a former home and everyone had their own room and it was very lovely. Cold too. There was cold up there. I was going to ask you, what kind of temperatures were you enjoying then? So you wanted to be by the fire and they had space heaters for us. <laughs> Interesting. So on this trip, so on a tire, you really need to bring like the whole gamut. Yes, because Galapagos was very hot. And then the mainland Ecuador was certainly much cooler, just layering with our down jackets and fleece. And yeah, you had to layer. Nice. Well, I tend to do that anyway, because you never know. And I bring the same things all the time. I just replace them when they wear out. So yeah. the next day you have a free day in Banos. Tell us about that. That sounds like the adventure capital, almost like Queenstown in New Zealand. Exactly. That was exactly my comment as well, because we've both been to New Zealand. And so anything you want to do, that's the place to go to Banos. And it's Banos, I think means water, ba bathroom. water. Bathroom. bathroom. And of course it has the thermal pool there. The hot spring. Oh, the hot spring. So that's why they're called baños. Because baños to me in Spanish means like the bathroom. We're like, where's the baño? That's the, where's the bathroom? So that's bath or spring. Okay. So that makes sense. And you're in a tropical cloud forest too. So tell us a little bit about what does it look like? And what are the kinds of things you can do there? Well, it's a beautiful town, like a sports town, I guess, or caters to sports enthusiasts, but it's at the foot of a volcano, an active volcano. And they have a big spiritual understanding with the Virgin Mary who looks after the town to ensure that if lava ever flows, it never comes down on the town. It actually flows around the town. As One, long as you have her picture hanging up. Oh, yes. You have to have her picture. So it's always neat to see how religion is tied into the communities and into some of the stories that are told, some of the miracles that have happened about how it saved their lives. So it is quite rugged. You can do climbing. You can do public parasailing. You can do whitewater rafting. You can do hiking. You can do biking. You can do basically everything that you would like you could probably find. 
So are there little offices down there that have, these are the different activities. You just go in and book whatever it is that you want to do, or how does that work? Yes. Just like that. And they have all these four wheelers you could rent. And we were fortunate in that it was our guide's day off, but he said, I don't really feel like sitting in my hotel room doing paperwork. He says, I'll take you around. So we went up to, um, we did the Devil's Cauldron, yes, uh, which was certainly a highlight for us. It's just this huge, massive waterfall, several hundred feet high. And they've built various stations that you can view this waterfall from. And just the power of the water running through the place. We had some great videos there, some great shots. We had a lunch there as well. But that's sort of almost a half a day trip. So we liked to do that versus the whitewater rafting and then had some other vista views along the way. I think one of the highlight was the treehouse swing. So it's actually a tree that they built this uh, structural swing and you can get someone to help you to get your height up, but you're actually swinging out over the side of the mountain and looking over the city. So it's quite a dramatic experience. And uh, certainly one of the places that you should visit when you do. And nearby, you can grab yourself a nice coffee if you want. But saw some great hummingbirds there as well. So they have some nice gardens. Is that where you took that great shot? Yeah. And we actually met the carekeeper or the gardener. And he's been there for probably around 40 years. And they have a newspaper article about him written a number of years ago, but 28 years he's been there. And he collects dust from the active volcanoes. So he had about 20 jars of dust that he would put out when the volcano erupted and there was the ash ash in the air. Quite fascinating. And there's a National Geographic shot of someone swinging on the swing with the volcano erupting in the background. So there's a lot of history there and exciting place to visit. I got two questions for you, too. With the volcano, how is the air quality? Oh, the air quality, you mean at the time of eruption, you mean? Or generally speaking, or is it something that's always erupting a little bit? Or uh, uh, No, I think it's every couple of years it will cough. Okay. And it might not erupt. It might be just ash that comes out. But every couple of years, I think the last one was 2017 or 2018. Uh, so about three or four years ago. Okay, but when in between eruptions, the air quality is okay? Yeah, otherwise you're in like a mountain community. Here you're at 6,000 feet above sea level. Okay, and then did you feel that their attention to safety was adequate and all the different adventures? Because didn't I see, Tina, that you went parasailing or something? No, I was on the swing. Oh, that was the swing. Okay, that was I could beautiful see. Swing. I, I thought you were, I was like, there must be a guy above there guiding that sail. I thought, all right, I didn't yeah. realize who that was. No. Okay. There was a seat belt on that swing because you really think twice. You're out there and you're like, I could just slip off this swing into the chasm. But our guide was incredibly safety conscious. In fact, we climbed up a waterfall a few days later and they were taking a video of it just so they could ensure active adventures that this is our protocol for safety when we're uh, we're doing this trip just with getting the harnesses on us and everything so no definitely we felt very safe i'm sure there are those places the storefront tour people who will take you on a raft ride or whatever that you want to make sure they're safe yeah, so I would definitely check if you're doing the excursions, maybe do a little bit of research before you go down there and maybe find your operator before you get down there rather than getting the bargain rafter. Yeah, and that's what our guide did too. I mean, even though he hung out with us that day, he did recommend which companies were good and who to use if we wanted to do some excursions. Yeah, because I have found that we kind of take for granted some of the precautions that operators in North America might be called upon to do may not be as strict in certain other countries. So as the traveler need to do a little bit of homework instead of just saying, oh, that sounds like fun and just going. Yeah. I can't tell you the number of times we've been on trips, especially in South America, where we're doing something and I would be thinking in the back of my mind, oh, they wouldn't allow this in North America. (laughs) But you rely on your guides to keep you safe. But yeah, for sure. In any case, 
not just on activities. The locals know whether it's okay to go out at night. Always ask the locals. They know everything and they want you to be safe. They want you to be happy in their country and they want you to go back and tell great stories. So exactly. when you doubt, just ask somebody local and they'll give you the yeah. right score. And that's something that I noticed David made notes about. I mean, Quito can be a dangerous city, but you just have to know which neighborhoods to go in. And we were comfortable walking on our own at night in the areas that we were in. And like you said, definitely check with the locals and be careful. And always, and do the regular precautions. Never, don't leave your drink unattended. Don't go down dark alley. You know, just use your common sense to bring that with you when you travel. Yes. Okay. So getting back to this, sounds like a really fun day in Banos. The next day you're in a valley, a rainforest, you're doing all sorts of things. You start off in a cloud forest, go to a rainforest and end up in the Amazon. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that day? We went down to uh, Tena. And that's another area in close proximity to the Amazon. That's when Tina mentioned earlier, we went on a hike that took us up a waterfall. And you're sort of in the jungle, and then you go when we had lunch there. And then we had a guide with us, a local guide. And then there was a series of ropes that were strung down these cascading stream slash waterfall. And so you were secured to the line, but you basically pulled yourself up. There were certain areas where you were sort of designated to stand and you watched the guy go up. And it was a real rush and quite satisfying because you are, it's getting humid now. You're around 2,000 feet and you're in, I would say, close to the cloud forest slash jungle. Mm -hmm. But an exhilarating action adventure. Oh, yeah. It was very exciting. And I often joke with David when David tends to organize these trips for us because he's retired. And often it's a bit of a surprise for me. I'll be like, you signed us up for that. And so the waterfall hike was one of them. And I love adventure and I love hiking and climbing, but this was definitely challenging. But again, felt incredibly safe And it was quite invigorating. And we had to hike out from the waterfall, which that was quite a long hike on our way out after. Yeah. Yeah. And you were looking at our schedule. We actually did this waterfall hike. They switched it around a bit. And then after that, we went into the Amazon forest. I want to go back, Tina. It sounds like you're a little bit outside your comfort zone doing this. What is your mental process when all of a sudden you're like, I don't know, what's David got me into now? You know, or something like that. How do you go from... Wondering if this is a good idea to challenge in your comfort zone to finally doing it. Can you tell us a little bit about your thought process? Well, my thought process is, oh, well, I have no choice. (laughs) We paid for it. Money is a motivator for me. I paid for it. I'm going to get my money's worth here. No, I just say, okay, okay. And I like a challenge, but sometimes it's sort of like you sometimes have to remind yourself you are on vacation, so you don't really want to be stressed. But I just walk myself through it and I see everybody smiling. I mean, it was just us, but usually you see other people doing it who are quite into it and having fun. And David was quite happy and enjoying it. And our guides too. Well, one of the guides was a local kid. He was just springing here and there. And I don't think he even had proper shoes on, but he he just was ambling around. And you could tell he had been doing it since he was a kid. So... It's good. Uh, You always do feel better after. Well, you feel good about yourself, I think, when you do it. And also, too, they're kids and we're in our 60s. So it's a little bit different, too. Were you amongst the older side of the spectrum of the ones participating? Well, as I said, it was just David and I. Did you have the whole waterfall? Yeah. Oh, wow. I thought there'd be other people there. Nobody there. Even where we had lunch. I mean, we really were on our own. But I was just citing examples of other places, like we did the tunnels in New Zealand, the caves. Oh, I love that. That was a highlight for me. I love that. Oh, see, I was sort of like... So I'd signed us up for that one, then Tina says, oh, is that what we're doing? You signed us up for that, and it was the Waitomo Caves. It was okay. I got cold. I thought we were in there a bit too long. But again, as I said... When I was telling you how I'm not a real water person, even though I grew up near it, you know, jumping with an inner tube into a (laughs) off a cliff was always challenging. 
But again, you do feel better after and the experience was really something. Yeah. I do remember too, when right before we even know what we're doing, when we picked up the water tubes. And so she's on that tall dock. I was like, if she thinks I'm going to jump backwards off of that dock, she's crazy. Realizing we're going to be on a little (laughs) doing on the side there. But I was like, all right, I'm sure they know what they're doing here, but that looks awfully high to me. (laughs) Yes. That's exactly how I felt, kid. It was sort of like, what? (laughs) But but that was a wonderful experience. One of my favorite trips. Did you do the South Island as well? Yeah. Okay. We were there for five weeks. Did you do the glacier hell hike? We didn't go, oh, in the helicopter, no, but we did hike up to the glaciers, yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that was. Yeah, we've done lots of helicopter trips, so we just thought, oh, we'll just stay close to ground. Yeah, no, that was a wonderful. That was my first time in a helicopter, and then they found these ice caves. Although the weather was bad for our kayaking. That would be the only drawback, I think, to that whole trip is that I wish we had an extra day down there because the weather didn't cooperate. So we didn't really get to go out in the Milford Sound at all. Oh, well, we were lucky. We left in the fog and it cleared up after an hour. We were on the water. We couldn't actually cross the sound because all the boats were using the foghorns and we had to wait for the fog to clear so they could see us. Yeah. So that would I'll have to get back. It's been another excuse to go back. Yeah. So I love New Zealand. That was a great trip. I'll put links to that in the show notes too. So those that have not listened to that episode will see that as well. So then well, let's get back to Ecuador. So do you also got a chance to visit with a local Napa River family? Can you yeah. tell us about that? That was certainly one of the highlights for us was the Amazon portion. So we drove down to, I guess, our area, which there were a number of boats that you could rent. And they use boats up and down the river. So this is a large river system, which is part of, we're in the headwaters of the Napo River. And the Napo River works its way down and into the Amazon. And the rivers are quite large, but they're brown and they're shallow. And with lots of, I won't say shoals, but gravel sides or sandbars. So you need someone to navigate you down. And we're in one of these large, probably 14 or 15 narrow boats powered with a motor and a driver. And they took us down the Napa River and we were staying at a lodge, the Cisco Lodge. And it was sort of our experience in the Amazon. And we got there late afternoon. We were sitting high on a hill overlooking the river. And it was quite a beautiful setting. And we were actually the only ones who were there at the time. They probably could accommodate maybe 20 people, 20 guests. And we had a lovely evening. Believe it or not, there were no mosquitoes. When you look at the website and you look at the rooms, you see mosquito nets over top of the bed. So we did actually use those, but we didn't need them. But it's probably an indicator to you that you should check for yellow fever vaccination. As a precaution, we did get our yellow fever shots, but probably didn't need them. We were just on the edge. We were just down there for two days, but a wonderful experience. And we had a nice breakfast the next morning. And then we went to, we got in the boat and we went further upstream to a little indigenous village. And we were greeted there and walked into one of their areas where they do pottery and a lovely indigenous person and her daughter joined us and they showed us how they do pottery and some weaving and actually Tina participated a lot in that. So I'll let you give your views, Tina. Oh yeah, it was like a a cultural center where all the handcrafts of the local people are shared. And their pottery is done just with hand-formed clay, and the dyes are all natural dyes. And they also did a lot of um, weaving with the grasses and made jewelry and sort of like macrame nodding. And it was just fascinating and just lovely, quiet, soft-spoken people. And she explained everything that she did all over an open fire and It was fascinating, really fascinating. Again, very quiet. We were the only ones there. So it really felt like our own trip. We bought some of the pottery and she gifted me with an extra necklace. And yeah, 
just lovely accommodating people. And the lodge where we stayed too, again, a family run business. In fact, one of the son-in-laws was our guide on the waterfall, but the food was excellent. Just excellent. Yeah. Just everything's fresh and good and lots of quantities. And I remember our guide again, like, okay, he was always questioning, like, what did you think of this accommodation? And because it was very rustic. And I said, I was just thrilled that I had my own bathroom. I wasn't expecting that. I thought, you know, we'd, <laughs> we'd have a shared outhouse and an outdoor shower. But no, we had our own shower and toilet, which was pretty swish, I thought. So. Oh, I take it the photo of the woman and child is this book you're talking about? That was actually her niece. It was sad. She was abandoned. So she took her sister's daughter who was abandoned. But yeah, and they made little headdresses for us. And I took some videos of them and just really very gracious and lovely people. And was her English such that you could communicate or did... um... I know our guide translated... But you could tell she kind of understood just from our mannerisms what we were saying. And the little girl was adapted. She was quite social. So, yeah, but no, they didn't speak English. Oftentimes I wonder if they can speak and understand better. They're just too shy because they don't want to use broken English. Yeah. And just very shy. I think that's just their mannerism, you know. Mm -hmm. Nice. So when I see here notes of the waterfall, that's the waterfall we already talked about in the hot springs. Or is that a different day? Yes, the, just the schedule in the itinerary was moved around, around a little bit to accommodate days and guides. Nice. Okay, but you did get to go to some hot springs as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. You went to the hot springs or hiked the grasslands up to the continental divide. Yeah, we did both. Yeah, we arrived late that evening before to the hot springs, and so we had late dinner. It, there was a road construction, and we were a little delayed. But we had a nice evening hot water bath, and there's a whole bunch of different pools of different temperatures. And plus, there's a big giant, more of a pool associated with the park that you could go to. There's a public area and a private area. So we were in the private area as part of this resort. And it was quite lovely. You could swim when people were in the pools, probably till two or three o'clock in the morning just relaxing, depending on what time they got there. And maybe they couldn't sleep, but quite relaxing. And uh, yeah, it again, when we were at the hot pools here, this was in the cloud forest. And so you're up a little higher now. We're up about 11,000 feet here. And they actually had a doctor on duty because you could suffer from altitude sickness. They had acetaminophen actually in the bathroom. So if you're feeling a little headachey, you can just take a seat of infant. So they were a very caring place, spa-like, and a nice place just to relax. It was quite contemporary. Like it was a high-end resort for sure. Yeah. And then they had the public area if you just wanted to come in and use the larger open, I won't say hot tubs, but hot pools. And is there a nice sky to enjoy as well? All the pools are outside. They were quite small because it was sort of like they were all in a courtyard facing from your rooms. I think they probably had several areas like that. Yeah, the sky, it was lovely. I do want to address, though, that holdup we had, David, because of the road construction or there had been a slide, remember? Yes. When we were heading back to the hot pools, all of a sudden the traffic, we're on these mountain roads, we're like almost clinging to a the edge of the mountain and all of a sudden we had to stop and our driver said oh his wife had called him and told him that there had been a slide so we were there when they were trying to clear the road from this rock slide and we were waiting for a couple of hours couple hours yeah. so we could even get out of the car and we walked maybe half a kilometer up to where the slide was and we could see the actual <laughs> part of the mountain had slid down onto the road and they had bulldozers there removing the rocks. And that was really something to see and to sit there for so long. And our guide was quite calm about it. And I said, well, what if we turned around and went back the other way? He said that would just add another six hours to our day. So it was worth the wait. But what I chuckled about too was near the slide, 
some local people had set up a little kitchen and they were selling hot food. Oh, that was smart. And they were also walking by us selling candied nuts and drinks. So everyone was taking advantage of a situation. So that made it quite interesting. Yeah. And things like that, they make the trip kind of fun. Oh, yeah. And you have you look to look at it as that. something to observe rather than something to get frustrated by. Yeah. And I think it's common because you are in such a mountainous region that does happen. And they have pretty good highways in Ecuador. They've spent an awful lot of money on them. So that made for interest. Good thing we had our books with us. We even did a little reading. Yeah. No, it was fun. Did you, anything about Ecuador surprise you? Did you have some misconceptions at all that were dispelled? I, I'd like to talk about a little bit about the main export of Ecuador, which is actually oil. Ecuador, Tina talked about roads and infrastructure. Ecuador, I think, uh, has gotten themselves into trouble by relying too much on Chinese money. So China lent Ecuador a lot of money to build infrastructure. But in return, they wanted access to resources. And resources, the best oil seems to be coming from the more indigenous areas in the Amazon, which are very um, sensitive environmentally. And so there's always this tension going on between indigenous rights, and then you're bowing to like a foreign government who wants to extract resources. And you pretty well know who's going to win that battle. But what we were seeing in the mountainous areas were these pipelines that were coming right down the mountains and they're not buried, they're on stands, so they're secure, but any shift, any rock slide, any earthquake has the potential to burst these pipelines. And I think they're gonna see some bad press coming out of oil spills in their desire to get oil from the Amazon down to the sea where they export it from. I didn't even know Ecuador was an oil country. I guess it makes sense. The other countries in the region are, I just, I never equated the two. Yeah. Yep. Ecuador is, while their second biggest export, which I didn't know, is flowers. Yeah. So a lot of the flowers we would see in North America here come from the greenhouses. Especially roses. That they grow in the rainforests. And then they transport them down. There's separate runways and warehouses just for flowers that they export. So a lot of hotels, when you go in, they have these beautiful bouquets of roses. Yeah. And then the third export is bananas, which we probably are. That's what you see from Ecuador is normally the, the export that we see is bananas. But yeah, I, I would think it was the more the political side of maybe some bad decisions in the export and selling resources that it could give Ecuador problems down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of countries, China's done that across the world. Yeah. And Ecuador also has a huge military presence. 20% of their economy is in their military and they have huge bases everywhere. And I think it's many people look at it as it's a good job and are well taken care of, but it's just fascinating how it's just prevalent everywhere. And there's a lot of, I believe, uneducated people who just kind of go with the flow. And I just got the sense from our guide that they just don't like their government at all because of poor decision-making. Right. Did you find that the people of Ecuador liked having tourists there? Were they appreciated or yes, in some places presented? So they, they did appreciate the tourist dollars coming in and the people coming in. They're friendly they, and happy. They definitely appreciate it and are very accommodating and want us to let people know that, yes, it's a lovely place to visit. It's very affordable, too. And it's all American dollars. That's one thing that I've noticed. It's very reasonable. And I know we met people who go there for several months at a time. It's sort of like going to Florida or something for the winter I think it was a nice surprise because you just sort of, you know, it's a tiny country and there's a heavy military presence, but just a very unique place to visit for sure. And they're gracious. It's actually high on my list to go see. There's a little town called Lojas that I'd like to go to, which is one of the university towns that's up the mountains a little bit. So it's like the perfect weather year round. It's like, that's on my list. 
It might rain a little bit too much for me, but I think a lot of times the rain just might be like every afternoon it rains a little bit, kind of like some places in Hawaii. So, yeah. That would certainly describe our experience in Mindo. And I know that that is outside of the Active Adventures tour we did, but we did quite enjoy our time in the rainforest in Mindo. Tell us about that. If, do you have time? I know I've, I've kept you long. Yes. So we stayed in a highlight. Yeah, we stayed in Quito for a couple of days. So we like to always extend our holiday from a combination of structured tours to just doing our own thing for maybe a week or a number of days. So we spent, I think, three days in Quito, which is a wonderful city. We can spend some time talking about that. But one of the things that I wanted to do was to get up to Mindo. And if you love the rainforests, so it will probably rain every day or 50% of the time it's raining. So you always have to have your rain jack with you. But that's where you have the real nature experience, almost a bit of jungle, but bird watching is huge there. And Mindo is about two, two and a half hours out of Quito. And I think I mentioned it's about 6,000 feet above sea level, I think. And how did you get there by bus or private transport? Yeah, we decided that we would stay that day. Uh, probably what you would call maybe an eco lodge or a tourist lodge, very small boutique. And we actually arranged with the owners to arrange for a car to drive us from Quito right up to their place. So you could take public transportation. It might be a little spotty and you're only there for a couple of days. So we decided that I think it might've been a hundred dollars maybe each way, but it was well worth it. So, you know, there's no security issues and you're getting driven right to the resort and you can start your day as soon as you get there. So we left the EB Hotel in Quito by the airport. Two hours later, we left at eight, we were there at 10, and then we had almost the full day there. And the first day we walked about 20 minutes down to the town of Mindo. There's a cafe right there, right, with hummingbirds. All the hummingbirds you ever wanted to see were right there in front of you with different viewing stations. And there were little feeders, so it's not quite 100% natural, but just a chance to sit down and have a coffee and watch the hummingbirds. And we also went to a chocolate factory there, which was very interesting, did a chocolate tour and brought back a lot of different samples for We were planning to do a chocolate taste testing after one of our Ecuadorian dinners that we were going to serve back here. Then we got hit by COVID, so we're still waiting for that dinner to happen. But we did rain a little bit, so we had our rain gear on, and we took a taxi back. And we had had a nice day in in the town of Mindo. And then we ate in town that night. A big hike with all the songs. The next day, we went on... um, It was at least most of the day, beautiful waterfalls that you could either walk up to, or if you want to take the quick view, they actually had like a ski lift ride, a chairlift ride that took you, it was just actually just a little bit farther up from where we were staying. We actually had, again, this resort had two or three dogs and one of the dogs was a stray and this dog led us up the trail. And there was a fork in the trail and we had to veer right. The dog knew exactly where to veer right on the trail. And then we found our way right in the parking lot and the dog turned around and went back to the resort. (laughs) How funny. Yeah, She was a smart girl. Yeah, quite amazing. And then we just paid a few dollars and we took the quick way up to the mountains because you had to get over a peak and then down the valley, another peak, and then then stop. And we hiked up a little bit and then there was these beautiful waterfalls and we basically just took a long hike down beside all the different trails down the waterfalls. That sounds lovely. And it sounds too like you just got to do all of your trip there right before COVID kind of blew up the world. Mm-hmm. We did actually. It was funny when we arrived in Galapagos Islands, everyone there at Customs and Immigration was wearing masks. And this was at the end of January. So They were well in tune with what was going on worldwide and were the first people that I saw actually wearing masks to protect themselves. Interesting. So hopefully when people are listening to this, because this is an evergreen podcast, 10 years from now, they'll wonder what on earth are they talking about? So it's, and the COVID era will be over and we'll be back to normal again. What's an evergreen podcast? Evergreen means this 
podcast will be played for 10 years. Most of my downloads are of previous episodes. So people in 2030 and 2040 will be listening to this. And I'm hoping that those people will have no idea what COVID is or some far flung thing, the way we think of the Spanish flu. Yeah, it's um, a tragedy. We were just very thankful that we did do that trip because I remember we were sort of waffling a bit about it and we decided, no, it's our motto is now or never, like just got to keep moving. That's right. And now we're just waiting until we can move again. So are there any final thoughts or things that we should know about Ecuador that we should keep in mind if we were to plan our own trip down there? Well, the one thing is no one rents a car. It's just even our guide said it's just rare because the roads just are tricky. And I think it's a safety issue too. So prepare to use local transit or get a driver that stood out. And we'd love to go back and see more, like travel more south of the country to where they make the Panama hats, which is a misnomer. Panama hats are made in Ecuador. Funny. I'm not sure if many people know that. And the reason they're called Panama hats is because they would be shipped to Panama and then be distributed to the rest of the world from Panama and that name stuck. But they're all made there. So that's down in uh, Cuenco, which is in the south. And that's another university town. Another university town. And it's a beautiful town. We didn't have a chance to get there. That would be on my list if we were going to go back. And it's probably a place that you would stay for because it's it's a bit of an expat community. It's that's very what I was about beautiful. To say, I think that's the expat town. Yes. Yes, that would be on our list the next time we went down to visit Coinco. Just a beautiful setting. I think you could just relax there for a while. If you're going to stay for a while, I would choose that as a destination. I think the other area that I really wanted to explore more, but we just didn't have the time, is the Amazon. Most people are fascinated by the Amazon. We want to get down into the jungle. And there are some very high-end resorts right on the Napo, but they might run $1,000 a night. But they're the full experience spas, living in very nice thatched roof, authentic structures. You can do the day tours out of there. There's guided tours two or three times a day going different places. You can get out on the Napo and do some fishing. I always wanted, I always wanted, one of my dreams is to do fishing for piranhas. That would be sort of on my bucket list, but I don't think I'm going to get there anytime soon. I actually have a picture of one of our other active guests. Oh, she must have been in Peru and she's got a picture of her where she caught a piranha. Wow. Yeah. So I would like to do that too. So when you were on the Napo, did you not feel like you were getting the Amazon River experience or not? To some extent, but we were just there for a day and really didn't do any tours into the jungle where some of these other places, they have big properties or access and you can really get down and do the tours into the jungle. Actually, the owner of the lodge that we stayed at, he wasn't there because he was off doing a private tour for two or three days into the jungle where they'd be deep in the jungle and they would be in with the snakes and the alligators and looking for the panthers and things like that. That's the kind of active tour that would be of interest to extend onto something else. To only David. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Good to say, well, first of all, I'll do some research and I'll try to put some links in the show notes of actual add-ons that you might be able to do, because I think when you're down that far, you do want to see the Amazon. Because how often are we going to be able to get back? So you want to try to do as many things as you can. And the second thing is seeing the panthers and all that. That reminds me of the Costa Rica Coast to Coast Trail that I was last week's show. Listen to that because you may be interested in doing that. It's a new Camino through the jungles and through the Costa Rica rural areas that sounds really cool that I'm going to be doing that in the summer of 2022 and putting together a group. So if you're interested, let me know. Uh, there's still some spaces available on that, but I think it's going to be a new long distance. Well, it is currently a new long distance trail in Costa Rica that the local people said, why don't we do our own Camino? And they've woven together all these rural villages. That's also giving them employment opportunities. Now they can stay in their villages because now they have somebody coming there to buy food and lodging and all that. And it's just, a really cool concept that, that I'm sounds very interesting to promote. And 
yeah, so that's going to be really cool. So listen to that episode if you listen to nothing else. So I really do appreciate you've been so generous with your time. I said an hour and a half and we've done two shows. I've taken over two hours of your time, but I'm so grateful. We've learned a lot about Ecuador and the Galapagos in the last couple of things. And I hope to get you back on sometime and tell us about other adventures that you've gone on. For sure. Yeah, we'd love to, Kit. Great catching up with you and we'll be a follower as well. Yeah, I hope so. And when you come back from adventures, be sure to let me know so we can hear all about them. There's only so much that one person can do. So I have to interview people to hear about the rest of the world. That's so great. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. If this is something that you'd like to do, how about joining me? I'm going in August of 2022. There's details on the show notes as well as on the website. You can just click the travel with me button. And I'd love to have you come along. It sounds like so much fun. And it's been on my bucket list to see the magnificent animals, visit the equator area, see the Amazon River, all these really cool things. And I hope you'll consider joining me. Don't forget, I do have a special promo code that you can get 5% off any Active Adventures and now Austin Adventures since they've merged tours. Just use the promo code ATA5, A-T-A-5, whenever you check out with any of their tours. It helps support the program, plus you get to save the 5% at no additional cost to yourself. And like I said, you're actually saving money. So I appreciate your support there. If you forget the code, you can always email me at kit at activetraveladventures.com. I also love getting your emails, just letting me know what you're up to. So we keep this as a two-way conversation. Thanks for listening. Until next time, this is Kit Parks. Adventure on. Adventure on.